No, my name is Kevin Tates. I own Patriotcation Instructional DVDs. Right now I do the Trucks TV show. I had a series on DIY Network called Classic, uh, Classic Rides. We did iconic American vehicles. We restored a Harley Electric Glide, uh, 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 Airstream trailer. And, and it was a fun learning curve for me because I grew up around muscle cars and trucks. And, you know, my dad, my uncles, my cousins, everybody was gearheads in my family. And we were dirt poor. We couldn't buy cars. We had to build them, right? So, you know, you learn through osmosis. You learn by being around people that are as passionate about, about this stuff as you are. And I'm sure everybody here is the same. And the fundamentals of, of painting like air delivery, like basic technique with spray guns, like following the rules that the substrates dictate. Um, you got There's two types of adhesion. There's mechanical and there's chemical. That's it. You can't stick anything to anything else without one of those two. So what we're going to be talking about are, are simple basic things like that. I have a classic car here. You can see, you can tell because it's got round headlights. And um, we've carefully masked up the wheel arches, so we're going to do some spray demos today. We're going to be using a water-based craft paint, and it's twofold. We're using this because it's safe to use in an open-air environment without safety gear. Um, I can't talk to you like this with a spray mask on because it doesn't, I, you know. So we're using water-based craft paint on cardboard because it sticks. And you can see the contrast of what I'm spraying onto the cardboard. We're not going to be spraying a whole lot, but the reason I want to talk about it is because it's a great training guide. Cardboard is free. You buy a refrigerator, you've got a car to work on, and you can practice techniques. I'm also going to be demonstrating some dry practice techniques. Um, this might look goofy, but trust me, there's, there's a purpose to this. We're going to be talking about air delivery, uh, air delivery systems, minimum requirements for an air compressor large enough to paint an entire car. Um, I get questions all the time online, on email, on the forums. Uh, I've, I've got a, a three horse, a 15 gallon compressor. Um, can I paint my car with it? The answer is yes. Should you? No, because it's not gonna look good because you don't have the air to supply the car. We were talking about CFM. The analogy I used is 100 PSI through this air hose is very different than 100 PSI through an air hose with this type of an inside diameter. The volume is vastly different and volume is what drives and squishes the paint today through the gravity fed guns that have to atomize it to a very fine mist. So paint has changed. It used to be lacquer. It used to be uh, a gallon of lacquer paint was about 17 percent solids. You guys know what percent solids means? Okay, well, if you don't, percent solids means what's left over after the solvents evaporate. Ap evaporate. So that's what's left on, the, on the, the, the panels that you're painting. With lacquer, it was 17% solids. Today, we've got paints that are upwards of 60% solids. So that's the difference. Now you've got 60% of what's in that gallon that actually stays with the car. That's your high-build polysurfacers. That's your high-build, you know, your, your, your uh, high solids clear coats. I mean, it's, it's amazingly different, and it's better in a lot of ways, and it's a, it's a heck of a learning curve in a lot of other ways. So uh, it's a different animal. You've got to have that volume. You've got to have the CFM. So the basic rules for an air compressor large enough to paint an entire car is a two-stage, five-horsepower, preferably cast iron pump with at least a 60 gallon tank because you need that clean dry air. Clean dry air has to happen because obviously you have contamination, moisture comes through the air, air lines, through the gun onto the panel. What happens with, with air coming out of an air compressor is that it heats up. So with a large tank like that and a pump that doesn't have to work that hard, your duty cycle is longer, which what that means is that it, it's a longer period of time between how your air compressor has to recharge. So you have your air compressor working less, the air is cooler, there's less moisture in it, so it comes out the end of the paint gun less. So the smaller compressors will continuously deliver enough air to actually get the paint out of the gun, but it's not good air. Nobody wants bad air, right? Baked beans, not good. So um, it has to be good air. So coming out of the gun, clean, dry air is essential. Uh, I don't have the demo here, but we did a live stream, and that's one of the things too. Um, you know, 
divert a little bit. What Eastwood is doing now uh, in conjunction, we're doing some from my shop in Tennessee. We did a live stream here yesterday afternoon, live video on the internet. It's, you know, you can call in, you can ask questions. They're about an hour long, the presentations, and, and it's free to watch. So I know you, a lot of you guys came some distance with guys from Jersey here, and guys came a long distance to, to not only come and see the, the open house and the store, but to, uh, to take part in, in a seminar. And thank you for that. I appreciate it. And uh, the, th the beauty of the Internet is that there's things like that available. There's a lot of bad stuff online. There's a lot of bad stuff, but there's some really great stuff too. And thanks to Eastwood, now we're doing live seminars once every month or so. So check on the Eastwood website. Check in for the Times, the Eastwood blog. We're doing a lot of cool stuff there, and it's, it's a neat thing to be a part of. So air delivery. Um, now we know what kind of an air compressor that we need. A lot of guys say, look, I got this compressor. I'm still getting moisture out of the line. My first question is, where are your water traps? Where is, are your filtering systems in comparison to the air compressor itself? And you get some people to say, well, I've got about a four-foot hose, and then my three-stage desiccant filter system. You know, those are expensive. That's several hundred dollars for a desiccant system. If you don't allow the air to cool, the moisture is still in the air. It has to, it has to separate, uh, and that happens when the air cools. Hot air is full of moisture, and if you hammer that through, it'll, it'll completely bypass those filtration systems. So what, what I learned through paint training classes, through having shops, through troubleshooting on my own, is that you need at least 20 feet, preferably 50 feet of air hose or line from your compressor before your first filtration system, before your filtration. So you're asking me now, here's my paint area. My air compressor is over here. Where am I going to get 50 feet? I'm not 50 feet away from the car. Here's what you do. There's a bunch of different ways to get 50 feet. You go from point A to point B in a straight line. Or you can go from point A, 10 foot run, over, 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 10 foot run, over. Space of about four feet, now you've got 50 feet of airline. Plus, you engineer the ability to have drains down at the bottom of that run. That's the way you cheat distance and get 50 feet of distance. Allow your air to cool down. Now, here's your pump, here's your first filter. So now you've got 50 feet of whatever you're plumbing your airline systems with to, um, to get that air to cool down so the moisture can separate so you have good air you've got good clean dry air coming into your paint gun and thereby you've eliminated problems before they even start some of the number one problems in painting as you guys know are contamination the stuff that falls in the paint the stuff that comes out of the paint gun those are some of the hardest problems to troubleshoot and figure out so if you can eliminate as many of these problems from the start like having enough CFM like eliminating moisture out of the paint system itself before it even comes to your gun that's a beautiful thing and that's what one of the goals are. The, uh, I just recently plumbed my shop. I bought a, a new workshop and I plumbed it with the modular airline systems from Eastwood. They are, uh, it's an O-ring type of a seal and it came from the medical air supply industry which has to be perfect. They're talking about oxygen tanks and airlines into operating rooms and and uh, one of the, the companies that we work with on PowerBlock is a company called Patton's. And I learned about these systems from Patton. Patton's biggest thing is, is medical supply. They've also got a division that does automotive. And it's a modular system. Uh, the Eastwood systems are, are very similar. It's an O-ring type steel. It's a compression fitting. It takes moments. Have you ever seen anybody thread black iron pipe? you got to have a separate machine. That's been the industry standard for years and years, the black iron. And it's okay. It's fine. There's a problem with black iron, though. It's black iron. And there's particulate on the inside of the ID of the pipe that can fall off and get into your paint gun. So it doesn't matter if you have clean, dry air. If it's dragging that garbage from the inside of that black iron, well, sometimes you can have contamination. So not the best thing. It's good. It's industry standard. And typically, it won't give you problems. But sometimes there's just random stuff that happens, stuff that comes through your airlines from that black iron systems. These, these new systems are aluminum. They rarely oxidize. They rarely, uh, and, and, correct me if I'm wrong, do, do they have a membrane on the inside? It's an aluminum with uh, poly on the inside and outside. So you're not even, as, as infrequently as aluminum oxidizes, you're almost never getting any contamination from the lines themselves into your system. It's a great system. The, the pliers that cut it come with it. And there, it's, it's a great, it took me about four hours to plumb my shop 
with a six foot extension ladder, you know, or a six foot fold out ladder. And that's a beautiful thing to me because time, time, right? Time, time spent on tools, time spent working on cars. These are irretrievable moments that we will never get back. So it has to matter. It has to be important. And for me, tools save me time. Learning, knowing, picking up skills, that saves me time. Time that I can spend driving my cars, spending time with my family, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, that's, that's, that's the reason I'm a tool geek and a tool junkie. Yes, sir. Refrigerated air systems. Yes, sir. What about refrigeration? Refrig are you still talking about refrigerated dryer? Are you still talking about 50T before the refrigeration system? That's a good question. The question was refrigeration system is in conjunction with your air compressor. Are you still talking about a 50 feet distance between your compressor and your refrigerator? Um, yes and no, you can have that. That does help. But what the, the refrigeration systems do is if it's right next to the pump, it hypercools that air coming off your manifold of that air compressor and you have a moisture separator right in that refrigeration system so that happens right off the bat I didn't talk about that because that's kind of an expensive add-on but I'm glad you you asked that question because there's a way to do this well a couple of guys on on the forums have done this um, very important to to do especially in a shop production environment in a commercial body shop you're gonna see if they're set up right you're gonna see refrigeration systems right next to the to the air compressors and that like I said hypercools the air lets moisture separate you get clean dry air at the other end here's a way to get around that you can get some copper tubing you can plumb off your manifold into a cheapo refrigerator or a freezer get a stand-up fridge uh, something from like a yard sale or something like that you do three or four coils of the copper tubing get a fitting on one end and and pack it full of ice in the refrigerator in the freezer unit sorry and then come out the other side of it well you've got now got a homemade cooling system comes off the manifold of your for whatever it cost you for the copper tubing the fittings and the and the fridge which is a heck of a lot cheaper than a commercial uh, refrigeration unit that comes off the manifold of the compressor so good question and and that's something that you can certainly consider on a, on a way to get better air coming off your manifold and by the way please ask questions if you have anything to ask if I'm if I'm contradicting something that you know try and bust me on it and, and we'll talk about it so so now that we know we've got enough air we've got clean dry air We've learned how to cheat distance in a small paint environment. Um, I don't know. Let's talk about... How about hose size? Hose size. Thank you. Hose size, 3 eighths inside diameter. 3 eighths ID. 3 eighths inside diameter. 3 eighths ID. Your quarter inch, your 5 sixteenths hose, not enough air volume to properly feed this guy. Even though this is a low CFM draw paint gun, you still need you still need that volume. And air hose length is important as well. I don't paint with anything longer than a 25 foot air hose. There's guys that have a 100 foot hose, even if it's 3 8 ID, even if your fittings are 3 8 ID, you're gonna have what's called line pressure drop. And what that is, is a pressure change from your wall regulator to your outlet, which is your paint gun. And with anything more than a 25 foot hose, it becomes a compounding factor in the line pressure drop, the line pressure loss, adds up it accumulates so a 50 foot air hose it's not just double what the line pressure drop and what you have is probably three times so you can shoot yourself in the foot and if you set your pressure at the wall regulator and if you don't use a regulator on the end of the gun you can rob that CFM you can rob the volume you can have rough texture issues you can have solvent trapping issues and you can shoot yourself in the foot on your project so learn how to use a 20 25 foot air hose and navigate that around the vehicle there's ways to do that as well. This is a really good air hose. What is, what is this? Yeah, made by us. Okay. <laughs> it's an Eastwood air hose. <laughs> no, but it's nice and flexy. It doesn't bird nest up or anything like that. And I can, I can take it and I can, I can make sure that I can travel around. Okay. Here, and I can get over here. So the type of air hose is important as well. And you can get air hoses. You guys have had those that just, they wad up and they tie a knot with them. So you just want to cut it up and throw it in the trash. But this is a decent hose. There's uh, another company, it's called Flexzilla, that makes a really soft air hose. They're really actually very nice. Problem with those is that when you step on them, it stops the airflow. So, and you can't weld near them either. <laughs> <laughs> this you could weld near and it's not going to burn through, but the Flexilla hoses, you know, they're, they're good and bad, but you just can't step on them. But anyway, there's lots of different options for, for air hoses, but 3 eighths inside diameter, 20, 25 feet, and your fittings. Um, these are standard fittings. No, that's a 3 eighths fitting. Okay. 
No, they look like both 3 -eighths. So, So these guys are on the ball here. So 3 8 ID fittings. That's, I had a demo done at a body shop I worked at and they brought in 3 8 ID fittings and 3 8 ID air hose. We had the same gun, same material, same setup on a test panel. My spray pattern grew by about two inches on each end just switching fittings, just switching air hoses. So that was a real eye opener for me. And it taught me the value of allowing that proper air delivery. We had a honking air compressor at the body shop I worked at. And it allowed the air that was coming out of that compressor to continue on to my spray guns. So it was a huge eye opener for me and it was a good lesson to learn. So that's something that I preach um, quite regularly. Okay, yes. Before you get onto that. Sure. You were talking about volume going through your airlines. Yeah. You get a three quarter inch air line going through your shop. Yeah. But then you funnel it down to a three eighth inch air hose. Don't mm -hmm. you lose that volume then? If you have a three quarter inch air delivery system around your shop, you funnel it down into a three eighth hose, do you lose volume? Well, yes, you do. But that's another reason for a 20 foot air hose, 25 foot air hose. If you can have, you know, I would say three quarter would be the smallest that you'd want to go for a drop coming off of off of like a halo system or an overhead airline system. Three quarter is is a nice size. People get by with less but three quarter gets you that volume without really compressing that air without restricting it very much. So it's um, in my opinion and my experience is that three quarter drops to your filters to your regulators uh, no you don't necessarily you don't rob it you don't starve it. So uh, half inch down, yeah, you're starting to starve your spray gun already. And so, you know, it, like I said, in my experience, my opinion, three quarter is the minimum ID that you want for, for your drops from your air delivery system. Now the optimum system is to create what's called a halo. And it's a system that goes around the, the, like the top of the room with your drops at your designated spots during the shop and preferably uh, you want a larger diameter on your halo, like inch, two inch, inch and a half, inch and a quarter, something like that, for your halo because that becomes an air storage vessel itself. And then your drops come down with three quarter and then you've got great air supply no matter where you're at. But your halo over top of the shop also gives you an opportunity to, to fool your water. Now I was talking about creating opportunities for water drainage. When you do, whether you do a halo system or just a typical airline system. Let's see this red line on the page. That's your ceiling. Here's your air compressor. I'm an artist too, just like Chip Foose. <laughs> so here's your air compressor. Looks more like a dress or a prom dress, but anyway, so here we're coming up here. Here's, here's your horizon line for your ceiling. Now, what you can also do is create an opportunity for gravity to help you eliminate water out of your traps. Start at a high point right off your manifold. Tilt it downward. That allows any moisture or water that's going to condense and come down in there and separate from the air to uh, have the assistance of gravity bringing it to a drop to where now you can come off of your drop, kick off to the side, have a water drain there and your regulator with your gauge right there. I know, another beautiful drawing. However, what it does is allows gravity to bring your water down here, straight down here, bypass your regulator, gives another opportunity to get rid of water before it ever comes into your gun systems. So did that kind of answer your question? Yes, it did. Okay, cool. So it surprised me to learn how much humidity you guys have up here. Um, that's, an, that's another uh, another thing that, that uh, we have in Tennessee. It gets 95 degrees, 90% humidity. I've got a buddy with a custom shop in Texas. He's painting in August at 104 degrees ambient air temperature. It's, that's bad. So that compounds everything that we're talking about with moisture separation and the importance of that in your air delivery system. So up here in the, in the summertime when you guys are facing those humidity problems, um, there's something that you can do also you know, and most of us are weekend warriors, right? Any professional painters? Awesome. Um, you know this because you do it day in and day out. Time of day matters big time. Now in Tennessee, when I'm shooting cars, if it's the heat of the summertime, I'm going to do my buffing in the afternoon and I'm gonna spray my cars in the morning. When I'm a weekend warrior and I've got a makeshift spray booth set up outside or if I'm in a garage environment, um, I found out that bugs are lazy. 
bugs like to sleep in. So if you don't want a bunch of bugs coming into your paint job, and they love clear coat, you guys know this, they, they, they swim for it, they go, man, I'm gonna get some of that. And uh, so they want the clear coat, and they uh, like to sleep in. So if you can time your paint job to early in the morning, get up at the butt crack of dawn, get in, get your stuff painted, the air temperature's down, your metal temperature's down, your bugs are still in bed, and there's less crap in the air, there's less dust and stuff in the air. So that's a really good tip that I learned the hard way and that I coach people on all the time, especially if you're in a home painting environment. Use the time of day to your advantage, and especially the pro painters know this as well, because it matters, you, you, you know, if you have solvent trapping issues because, you know, the temperature, it skins over on the top, it's bad, it can cause a redo, and it can cause, you know, uh, us to scratch our heads and wonder what the heck's going on. So. Um, that I find uh, is, is really relevant when, when you're trying to trouble through, shoot through problems as well. You can buy the most expensive paint gun and it's like buying a surgical scalpel to cut up a cardboard box. If you don't know the fundamentals, if you don't know what the gun does, um, and, and honestly even how to hold it, it, it just doesn't matter. You, you've, you haven't spent your money well. And on, on that note, you can get fantastic results out of a budget spray gun like the Evolution or the Concourse here if you know how to use it, if you pay attention to the fundamentals. Um, my, my car, Jaded, the, the 66 Mustang that I built, it debuted at SEMA last year. It's, uh, I'm so uh, honored and privileged that Popular Hot Rodding Magazine has done a, a feature shoot for it. It's going to come out, in, I think, in the December issue. And I used all Eastwood paints and materials from the bare metal up. We started talking about this about a year and a half ago and they said, hey, we're getting ready to launch our new paint line. And so we, we had a meeting of the minds and we said, let's do Jaded in the Eastwood Base Coat Clear Coat system from the bare metal up, epoxies, polys, fillers, all this kind of stuff, everything that's on that car. It's this car here. They allowed me to name the color. It's called Jaded Green. It's because the car is named Jaded. I guess you could probably figure that out. But it's got all Eastwood stuff on it. There's Tunnel Ram Gray, the Eastwood Hot Rod Flat Clear on it and uh, the materials were great. I used these spray guns to spray the car too. And I'm proud to say that on the floor at SEMA where the best hot rods in the world are, we held our own there, you know? And it, it, it was, I had the help of many good friends and lots of people that are really talented to do the car and to finish the car on time because it was a crazy time frame. However, my point is the Eastwood materials, the Eastwood spray guns, they got me there too. So um, when I say you can spend 700 bucks on a spray gun or you can spend 170 bucks on a spray gun and get the same results. I've done it, I've seen it, it's gonna be in popular hot rodding in December. So, um, not that I'm all that. I know what I know and I know it very well, you know? So, so the beautiful thing about what we do here is we can pass some of this stuff on. One of the things that I've found is that holding the spray gun the right distance from the panel as well as the right orientation to the panel is key. It's, it's really important. When we spray paint, if I'm leaning across the hood, my tendency is to stand still. You see what I'm doing? I'm painting in an arc. I'm also, I'm lazy. So my spray pattern is goofy. When my spray pattern gets goofy, here's my surface. Here's my spray pattern. Here's my fluid tip. What happens when I tilt here, that's perfect orientation. That's 90 degrees, that's perpendicular to the surface. Now when I do this, here's my surface. The cone coming off of the gun doesn't change. So what happens there? I'm really heavy on one side, I'm really light on one side. I get tiger striping, I get an inconsistent coating, I get an inconsistent surface. You know, we're human beings, we're people, we get tired, our arm gets fatigued. Spraying an entire vehicle or a van or a bus or a conversion van or something like that, the, the pressure in your forearm, it gets really, really taxing on you. So it's a, a, just a natural tendency to, well, I call it getting a little lazy, but basically it's just your, your fatigue that, that has to, uh, you have to accommodate for. So when I'm stretching out over a panel here, guess what I'm doing? It's hard to do that, but you gotta do it. You gotta do it. So if you're a novice, if you're a newbie, here's a training technique that you can do without spraying a drop of paint in your gun, without ruining a practice panel, without ruining a paint job and having to redo it. This is just a simple throwaway spray, uh, paintbrush. Okay, there's a sweet spot with these HPLP guns, and it's typically about right there. 
It's about six inches from the actual spray nozzle. Now, back in the day, we were talking about the old Bink 7 guns at 70 PSI with a tank, a siphon feed, and overspray clouds that you could see from the space shuttle. Well, your gun distance was about 12 inches, and your spray pattern was about that big, and you were wasting a whole lot of material, which, as we talked about before, was about 17% actual paint that stayed on your panel. So there was a whole lot of waste happening. So in, in a way, it's a good thing because we're, we're not wasting as much paint material. We're not putting about enough, as much bad stuff out in the atmosphere, blah, blah, blah. The birds are still blue and, and all, that, all, the, all the things. You know, the grass is still green. Great, because we have pancake syrup for paint now. Anyway, so the techniques have changed as well. We're tighter to the panel. We're closer in. So this, um, this brush here acts as a guide. Um, I need somebody's help. Who wants to volunteer? Come on, buddy. <laughs> See how quick he was? Yeah. That was a mistake. What's your name? Michael. Michael, I'm Kevin. So are you a gearhead? You a car guy? Yeah. Nice, nice. So you get your hands dirty and stuff? No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> He's honest. All right, well, you're going to learn how to paint, okay? Right, you know the basic idea for, for spray painting, right? Yeah. Okay. Hold it in your hand. You see how heavy it is? Yeah. Okay, you got to pick up with your arm here. Now, what I'm talking about, okay, stand with me over here. We need a shorter car. We need a shorter <laughs> car. Hey, I'm, I'm altitude challenged. I'm not short. So he's, he's, he's going to grow out of it, but I never will. So here's what I want you to do. Okay, this is comfortable, right? Okay, put your hands to your side. Okay, stand beside me. All right, with your feet just slightly apart. Actually, let's do the opposite. Put your feet together. And... Try and move like this. You feel like you're going to fall over, right? Yeah. All right, now, feet apart, about shoulder width. Now what can you do? Now you can go all over the place. And I'm not going to knock you over, right? <laughs> I could, but I won't, right, because he's a good kid. Anyway, so, so that's rule number one, okay? And to keep your shoulders, what I call this is a comfort zone, because you're comfortable, right? So now, when I'm painting, I'm relaxed here, my feet are slightly apart, and I'm in a comfort zone. I'm comfortable. So when I'm painting, I want to be comfortable because the last thing I want to think about is my arm is sore and, and the panel. When, have you ever hammered a nail? Yeah. What are you looking at when you hammer a nail? You're looking at the hammer, you're looking at the nail. Looking at the nail. Yes, sir. He's a smart man. You're looking at the nail. When you're spray painting, you're looking at the panel. You're not paying attention to the gun. You've already set the gun up. So you're looking at your panel and you're painting like this, and you're watching the paint as it goes down. If you're looking at the gun, you're missing the boat because you're not paying attention to your gun distance. So this guy's going to be a great painter one day. Okay. So grab that in your hand. Stand right in about in the middle. Now, when you hold your arm out, it's going to get heavy, but here's what you want to do. You want your paint gun straight up and down. You see where that, that paint's going to travel? That's what you want. Now, try and follow this tape line. Go to that side. And this side. Okay? Now, remember what I told you about moving side to side? Now move at your hips and then this way. Okay, see what's happening with that paint gun? It's staying in exactly the same place, right? It's not sweeping. You're not arcing like that, which is going to make a messy pattern there. You want to follow that tape line. So when you move your hips and that spray gun with you, you can keep it perpendicular. You can keep it in the right orientation. So lesson number one. Move with your hips. Spray paint like that. Try and keep your arm. What you want to envision. Have you ever seen those videos of the robots that paint cars? Yeah. That robot doesn't, his wrist doesn't get tired, does it? <laughs> that head with, that puts the paint out onto the car is going to stay in the same place all the time. It's programmed to do it, just like a computer. It is a computer with a thing that pulls the trigger. So what you want to have in your brain is that you're that robot. You don't move. You keep your orientation. You keep it perpendicular. Now, one of the things that I noticed, tell me your name again. Michael. Michael has a little bit of a problem with the gun kind of falling down because it's, it's heavy. It's extended out here. You fill that with a quart of paint and it becomes even more so. So what we want to do is keep that gun the perfect distance. So I'm going to give you a different gun. Let's trade. Michael's saying to himself, this is spray painting, not brush painting. What are we doing here? Uh -huh. Okay, here's what you want to do, Michael. Keep those bristles from touching the surface. Okay, now, like I said, use your hips, follow that tape line. 
See how hard it is to keep that perfect? Yeah. It, it, you got to really focus on it, don't you? Okay, but that's what you want to do. You're doing great, by the way. So that's the orientation you want your spray gun. You want it that far off the surface. And this paintbrush, it might look silly. It doesn't matter. It's a dry training guide. And you can take and you can follow. You can practice your overlap. And you can work your way up that panel. And you can paint and get that muscle memory. It's about repetition. It's about muscle memory. It's when this, how old are you? Um, 11. You're 11. Okay. Five years you're going to be driving, which kind of scares me. But... <laughs> When, <laughs> are you his dad? Okay, thanks for letting me beat him up here. So, okay. There's a difference. There's a saying, uh, you're, you're consciously competent or you're unconsciously competent. Consciously competent is when you're 16 years old and you know how to drive a car and you're safe on the road because your cell phone's in the console. You're not distracted driving. You're safe on the road and you're consciously competent. You're not hitting the stop sign. You're not overrunning the intersection. You're not bumping up on the curb. You're consciously competent in driving that car. When we're 16, we all could drive. Now, when you're 20, you're unconsciously competent. What that means is that your muscle memory is finely tuned. You're finally developed on that skill set of driving and navigating that car. And you can become distracted, but you're very comfortable. You're a very good driver when you're 20 compared to the driver that you were and that you're going to be when you're 16. So that's the difference between consciously competent, which is competent, and unconsciously competent, where your muscle memory kicks in. That's what happens with bodywork and painting. So when you don't need this paintbrush anymore when you're unconsciously competent, when you have that muscle memory built up, when you can paint. That's the best analogy I've ever heard described to me as to the difference between those. And that's your goal when you're painting, is to where you don't have to think about it. You have to think about the panel. You don't have to think about your delivery system, the spray gun, or anything else. So, go ahead and put that back in your hand. There you go. So now, follow this tape line again for me. Okay, you're starting to do it a little bit, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold your arm. What I want you to do is break your wrist. When you come, come over here, you feel that feeling in your wrist? And I'm not hurting you, am I? Okay, cool. When you come over here, your wrist breaks. So it's a conscious change in your wrist. And it's a, it's a distinct feeling that you have. It feels very different when you, when you break your wrist off like that. But it's very important to keep that spray pattern Perpen uh, completely perfect on the panel. Now, we're going to talk about overlap. Everybody knows what overlap is. You're building a coat in stages. You're a stripe here, 50% overlap, 50% overlap, 50% overlap, and you work your way through the panel and do that. So now what we're going to do, Michael, we're going to start here. Okay, go from this side to this side. Okay, work with your hips. Remember your lessons. Okay, so we're going to do once. Start from this side. And we'll work over to this side and stop. Okay, now move your, your brush up to here. Okay, now go to the other side and stop. Move your brush half the distance and then come over to this side. Okay, now move up half the distance again and come over to the, the other side. So now he's traveling. Now he's using overlap, he's using perfect spray gun technique, and he's working with his body, he's breaking his wrist, he's in his comfort zone, he's working like the karate kid, he's working the panel, and now I wouldn't be afraid to hand you a paint gun and have you practice on a panel. So give Michael a big hand. He's a good, good student. Michael.